Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel and today's video where we're going to unpack BK nephropathy using an MCQ that was given to me by some of the Dr. Humans at a recent live event that I ran. It was a transplant webinar, we went through a 90 minute workshop covering everything you need to know about transplant for your exam. If you missed that and you want to get your hands on that, I have actually made that available for a limited time. If you click the link below, you can get through to that recording. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. So this was one of the MCQs that one of the students brought along to the session. Which test is performed to assess the risk of developing VK virus associated nephropathy in transplant recipients? And those are your options. Which one of these do you think is the right answer? Is it BK serology in the donor or recipient? Is it the BK virus NAA, which I take to mean nucleic acid amplification? If they'd said PCR, it would have been more straightforward, but we're just going to go with nucleic acid amplification test, PCR. So is that the answer? Is it the BK virus in the recipient blood? Is it the BK virus in the recipient urine? Or is it urine cytology test to look for decoy cells? We'll come back to answer that after a very quick mini tour on BK nephropathy. So BK virus is a little polyoma virus that most of us are exposed to in early life. So 90% of us have seen this before. And if you've been exposed to this virus, it tends to stay with you for life. And it loves to hang out inside your urothelium. I don't know why it likes to be there. That's just where it likes to hang out. So it's kind of, it's in your urinary tract all the time. So in a renal transplant situation, the BK virus is coming in with the graft. It's inside the kidney, it's inside the donor ureter. And one of the things I absolutely love about BK virus is it is just so predictable. So in order for BK virus to cause BK nephropathy, it has to go through a few stages. It has a natural history and it cannot skip a step. If BK virus does reactivate, the first thing that will happen is it will replicate and it will go cell to cell to cell. The next thing it will do is get into the bloodstream. So we'll get BK viremia that we can pick up with PCR testing of the blood. Then only after that would it then pose a risk of BK nephropathy. So it goes from replication to viremia to nephropathy. And even then, the nephropathy changes are associated with viral loads of about 10,000 copies per mil. So you can see how that gives us a lovely window of opportunity, a scope for intervention, right? If we can catch the BK virus early before it gets to 10,000 copies per mil, we're able to hopefully prevent BK nephropathy from happening at all. So in someone who's had a kidney transplant, what we do is we monitor their BK virus PCRs, um, usually monthly for the first nine months or so, and then every three months thereafter, out to about two years. And we're just looking for these viremia levels. And if we find BK viremia, even at that sort of thousand copies per mil range, we will start to manage that by reducing their immunosuppression so their immune system can get on top of the virus and BK nephropathy can hopefully be prevented. So it's something that we can anticipate and check for using those BK virus PCRs. Now, the, the way that we manipulate the immunosuppression will differ from center to center. So I'm not going to comment on that here because it's likely to be different wherever you are. But basically, it usually means either a reduction in their mycophenolate dose or their calcineurin inhibitor, one of those two things, if not sequentially, depending on their situation. So we'll drop the immunosuppression, and that is the mainstay. Allowing the body to get rid of that viremia will hopefully prevent any BK nephropathy. But even if they did have BK nephropathy, the treatment would be the same. We would drop the immunosuppression. And sometimes in that situation for established BK nephropathy, we also give them IVIG, so high dose intravenous immunoglobulin once a month. And the rationale for that is twofold. First of all, the immunoglobulins can bind to the BK virus and kind of neutralize that virus to some extent. So that will only be impactful for the BK that's in the bloodstream. It's not going to help with the BK virus that's in the kidney. We're going to rely on the immune system to go in and do that. The other reason we give IVIG is it can help to 
mitigate the risk of rejection. So if we're dropping someone's immunosuppression to try and get on top of this BK virus, we think it gives a little bit more protection against rejection. So that's not intuitive at all. Um, But basically with IVIG, how we think it works in that respect is that we're giving a lot of antibodies and that tells the immune system, listen, we've got a lot of antibodies kicking around. You don't have to be making all the antibodies. So that could protect someone to some extent from antibody mediated rejection. Now, in terms of how you diagnose BK nephropathy, of course, the gold standard would be to do this on a kidney biopsy. And there's a little biopsy buzzword that you're looking for, and that is SV40 staining. If you see SV40 staining on a kidney biopsy, it basically means you're dealing with BK nephropathy. It's nothing else. SV40 staining equals BK nephropathy nephropathy. But we don't biopsy everyone. Like I say, if we catch it at the viremia level, we'll manage it there. Um, But of course, you would biopsy people who had graft dysfunction, their kidney function's gone off, you're going to biopsy them. That would diagnose BK nephropathy, but it's also going to delineate other causes of um, allograft dysfunction, like rejection, for example. Now, something else to mention here is decoy cells, basically little cells on urine cytology that have cytopathic changes of BK virus being inside them and they have these big nuclei and so they can look like cancer cells because of that and that's why they're called decoy cells because they could look like something else. Um, So decoy cells can happen um, with BK virus and BK viral shedding but they don't necessarily mean much more than that. So The presence of decoy cells could be a normal thing. You could have a little bit of viral shedding here and there in a healthy person. It doesn't help to delineate whether they have nephropathy or viremia or anything else. So sometimes that is used as a screening tool in some countries where BK virus PCRs aren't as accessible, but certainly here in Australia and many other places where we have access to BK virus PCRs, that would be the best way to monitor for the risk of developing BK nephropathy, and it also allows us to intervene and prevent BK nephropathy. So coming back to our question, which test is performed to assess the risk of developing BK virus associated nephropathy? So this is going to be the BK virus in the recipient blood. That's going to be the best screening test for risk of BK nephropathy. So that was BK nephropathy in a nutshell, basically everything you need to know um, for your exams and doctor life, unless you're a transplant physician, in which case you probably need to know a little bit more than that, but that's enough for for most of us mere mortal doctor humans around the place. Thank you so much for joining me today. And as I mentioned before, if you did miss out on the transplant tutorial, then go ahead, click that link below and we'll hook you up. All right, thank you so much for joining me. Have a great week and I'll see you again soon for some more higher learning.